Good morning all, uh, it's Miguel de Costa, the ED Education Fellow. I am presenting Urological Emergencies. I'm keeping this short and sweet. If you have any questions, you're more than welcome to ask me. And I hope you enjoy your time here at West Med. So just a basic introduction. Failure to recognize true urological emergencies may result in renal failure, organ damage, or loss of sexual function. Given the nature of urological problems, patients may delay treatment. And this is a key point. Patients often present late with urological problems. Always get a good history, including sexual history. Ask for a chaperone when necessary and get comfortable examining the urologic system, neurogenital system. So topics, um, there are a couple of topics there. Um, the slideshow will be attached, I can appreciate that some of the, the wording might be a bit small. So see the attached literature and uh, you'll be able to follow this presentation. So my first topic is lower urinary tract obstruction. So acute urinary retention is the most common urological emergency um, and it presents with sudden complete inability to void. Uh, normally affects men more than women and the incidence increases with age. Um, acute urinary retention is most often caused by bladder outflow obstruction, so normally due to BPA, so benign prostatic hyperplasia, prostate cancer, constipation, etc. In women there are multiple causes, uh, but common causes are normally uh, pelvic organ prolapse. Um, but just realize that there are many possible causes um, and a wide spectrum of different etiologies, such as anesthesia, spinal cord injury, constipation, infections. So exhaust your list and think broadly. So always confirm the bladder ultrasound and document findings. Um, so these bladders, there's a bladder scan available in a &E. Get comfortable using it. It's very easy to use. Uh, and if we have it, I think you should be using it. Don't just document the bladder feels full or the patient complains that their bladder is full. Get a number, write it down. When you speak to urology, they will probably ask you this. Um, you can also pr proceed directly to bladder catheterization, which is both diagnostic and therapeutic. So if a patient's bladder is very full and you can't find the bladder scanner, don't go looking for the bladder scanner and waste time. You can put a catheter in. After bladder decompression, most patients can be managed as other patients, uh, unless there's an indication to admit, such as sepsis, malignant obstruction, acute myelopathy, or renal failure. So upper urinary tract obstruction. So upper urinary tract obstruction or hydronephrosis may occur at any level of the ureta. And the causes of upper tract Obstruction include renal or urethral stones, congenital abnormalities or urethral strictures. This table includes causes of bilateral hydronephrosis. Just have a read through it. Understand that there are multiple causes of bilateral hydronephrosis. So I've included renal stones, and that's because we see it quite commonly in, the, in our population. And you should be comfortable um, in seeing these patients. So often, um, Males over the age of 40, they come in with nausea and vomiting and pain radiating to the flank. Um, often described as a sharp, severe pain, maybe intermittent. And also they can often describe hematuria. So diagnosis, um, often clinical, combined with um, a urine dipstick, which would often show blood in the urine, but also do baseline blood such as CRP, um, full blood count, and check the renal functions that you use in these. Um, there are multiple risk factors which are listed there. Um, so the NICE guidelines on renal and ureteric colic um, will be linked below and just gives a good general management of renal stone. So have a read through that and you will see many cases of renal colic so you should be comfortable in dealing with that. Obstructive pyelonephritis develops from an infection in an obstructed kidney. 
The cytoplasm obstruction can occur at any level along the ureters and may result from stone, a tumor, or urethral stricture, or a congenital obstruction. Variable symptoms upon presentation. Um, so many will have the classic symptoms of renal colic, fever, dysuria, and the convertible tenderness, and some may present septic. Um, so management, or if you're based on bloods, I've listed the minimum bloods that you should be doing there. A urine dipstick is very important, so I'd advise you to do a urine dipstick in all patients who have abdominal pain and back pain. Um, and don't forget pregnancy tests in females. Um, then you can always discuss imaging, CT, so discuss it with the registrar, um, the any registrar on uh, running the floor um, in terms of further management and now I'm going to the CT. So a key point here is that acute pyelonephritis cannot be clinically differentiated from obstructive, obstructive pyelonephritis um, and imaging studies required for definitive diagnosis. Next topic, gross hematuria with clot retention. So gross hematuria generally, prompt for, generally prompts urgent medical attention. Um, common neurological problems that cause hematuria include renal and bladder stones, prostate cancer, and prostate enlargement. Uh, medical causes include anticoagulation, nephritis, and inflammatory conditions. Um, it's seldom a urological emergency unless the patient is um, hypertensive, anemic, or they develop obstruction, um, secondary to blood clots. The management, so always document your findings, uh, ultrasound to check then retention. Gross hematuria with obstruction, with obstructing clots requires placement of a large urethral Foley's catheter, and then you discuss with urology. Uh, for many so irrigation, irrigate the bladder to eva evacuate the obstructing clots. So I would advise you to get comfortable also um, using three-way catheters. So if a patient has obstruction due to clots, um, find where the, the three-way catheters are kept, ask the nurses, learn how to use them. I know many of you haven't put, probably put them up, but insert your three-way catheter and it gets the bladder gets uh, continuously irrigated. Um, with saline. I would advise using a three-way cath if a patient's got clots and they're in obstruction, put in a three-way catheter first, don't just put in a normal Foley's catheter, which then has to be replaced and causes the patient quite a bit of discomfort. Testicular torsion is my next topic and this is something that cannot be missed. And uh, normally presents the rapid onsets with severe testicular pain and swelling. Um, so diagnosis should be considered in all men with scrotal pain, uh, regardless of age. The classical physical examination uh, includes an exquisitely tender testicle with a high horizontal line. That being said, any tender testicle have a high index of suspicion for testicular torsion. Um, signs of infection are, ab are usually absent, but later in torsion you can have a raised Y-cell count, and that's normally a response to uh, inflammation. So if you have a suspicion, refer early. Testicular preservation is excellent if um, done within four to six hours of onset. Beyond 12 hours, the risk of subsequent testes atrophy is significantly higher um, with the torsion. So if you have a suspicion, refer early. Um, another problem causing tender testicles is uh, infections such, such as uh, epididymitis and epididymoorchitis. Normally in, in men younger than 35, it's normally due to chlamydia or gonococcal infections. And in older men um, who have underlying urological problems, they can have enteric gram negative bacteria leading to ascending urinary tract infections. And those are the more, more likely cause. Um, there are also non-effective and inflammatory forms of epididymitis and epididymoorchitis. Um, and I think between the two, the testicular torsion and infection, there's always a dilemma in deciding what do we have there. A patient presents with te a tender testicle 
painful testicle. Um, how do we how do we know the difference? Um, so it's actually difficult to distinguish on physical examination from scrotal trauma or test distortion. Um, the very sudden onset of pain and swelling is more typical of torsion, while the more gradual progressive onset pain suggests epididymitis. But that's not always the case. Um, so refer early if you have any suspicion. On physical examination, epididymitis presents with tenderness, um, posterior and lateral to the testes. Um, the scrotal ultrasound will distinguish um, condition from torsion or trauma. I think the take home point from that is that uh, any tender testicle or painful testicle, you should always have a high suspension of testicular torsion, speak to the urologist and let them assess the patient further and make the call. The fornia's gangrene is um, a life threatening necrotizing infection of the perineum, seen in both men and women, and common in the immunocompromised. Um, the presentation is usually swift and there's a dramatic presentation. The diagnosis is clinical, so if you suspect it, uh, treat promptly. Um, start with empirical um, empiric treatment, uh, but the patient needs extensive surgical debridement and drainage. Treatment of the antibiotics alone has 100% mortality. So involve the surgeons early and treat early with empiric antibiotics. The take up point I think from the slide of Fournier's gangrene is that if we can't find a, a source of infection or we are unsure of what our diagnosis is, I think we should always look further. So examine your patients thoroughly, um, do a head to toe examination and exclude all possible causes um, and therefore, and in that way, we won't be caught up. This probably has caught up many people. We often avoid the urogenital system or don't examine the back properly and are caught up later on. So, priapism, um, not commonly seen, but um, basic priapism is a persistent penile erection that continues hours beyond or unrelated to sexual stimulation um, and it lasts for at least four hours. So there are two types, ischemic and non-ischemic. Um, ischemic priapism is the more common type. So ischemic priapism results um, in a low inflow and low outflow dynamic. So basically get penile compartment syndrome, um, which ultimately leads to necrosis. So common causes include drugs, um, neurogenic and in children sickle cell is the most common cause. So they present with a painful, prolonged, and fully rigid erection. Um, so men will present with a erythematous tendon, fully erect corpus cavernosum, with a soft glands and corpus spongiosum. Take on point, irreversible damage is seen after 24 hours. So it is a medical emergency and requires immediate treatment. The non ischemic priapism, non-emergency, Far less common and it's usually a result of a fistula. Um, but normally they present with a, a partial and non tender erection. Penis is usually much less rigid than in the ischemic type. So, how to differentiate the two? Um, a blood gas would, be, um, would normally be used. Um, so, a blood gas drawn from the corpora cavernosum. Um, if you have dark blood, that's hypoxic, um, with hypercarbia and acidemia is indicative of the ischemic subtype. With um, bright, if you have bright red blood, a normal gas um, is indicative of non-ischemic subtype. We don't expect you to be doing this. I think just call urology if you suspect it. Um, and what's also used is a penile Doppler, so basically it shows the the flow, um, penile blood flows. So also not common scene, but a penile fracture. So um, this occurs when the penis is forcibly bent, causing a rupture of the tunica albuginea of the corporal bodies of the penis. Um, so it's a clinical diagnosis um, and also based on the history where men describe a pop 
when the tunica ruptures, followed by immediate pain, and then the penis loses that erection. So um, then they develop a significant ecchymosis involving the shaft of the penis and substantial penile swelling. And they get what's commonly referred to as the eggplant deformity. So there's an image there. So this is a urological emergency. It's, um, it requires surgical repair. Parafimosis, commonly seen in children, but can occur in adults where the foreskin becomes retracted behind the coronal sulcus of the glans penis and will not return to the normal position. Basically, this leads to venous and lymphatic outflow obstruction, um, so arterial inflow to the foreskin and to the glans becomes occluded, and then you get local skin necrosis, infarction, gangrene, and auto-amputation of the glans. Um, there are four, four causes, um, and it's heterogenic, anatomic, traumatic, and non-hygienic. Uh, just remember that infants can present with general irritability. But get comfortable in looking at um, children and examining their urogenital system. So management. Um, so always rule out a uh, constricting foreign body, including hair, rubber bands, rings or piercings. Patients may have urinary obstruction. Urgent pain control is essential for these patients. And uh, once analgesia is achieved, manual reduction can be attempted. Penetrating and blunt testicular injury. So testicular, eruption res testicular rupture results uh, when there's a laceration of the tunica albuginea of the testes, uh, such that the st testicular parenchyma may uh, extrude. As a general principle, uh, penetrating injuries of the scrotum should be surgically explored. So have a low index of suspicion and urology should investigate. Don't assume that there's only a small superficial cut and uh, discharge a patient. Get urology to investigate further. Um, ultrasound can determine the degree of tis, uh, testes injury, uh, but that should be ordered by urology. And then inguinal hernia. So I've covered, it's covered by the surgeons, but I've included in um, in this section because it can often present as an acute scrotum. Uh, pain and swelling involve both the scrotal contents and um, the groin area. Um, an incarcerated ingle hernia involves bowel uh, that, is, that is obstructed, and this is a true surgical emergency. So management, analgesia, and refer to surgeons promptly. And that's the end of my presentation.